Hey everyone, welcome to the Grad Coach Podcast. My name is Derek, and today I'm joined by Dr. Ethar, one of our trusty coaches, and we're going to be talking about four cheat codes that you can use to fast track your research proposal. If you are busy crafting a research proposal, you will definitely want to check out our free proposal template. You can find the link to that in the description. So without further delay, let's get this party started. Dr. Ethar, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me. You know, I had a couple of content reviews to do, some clients to see, but I feel like you might be missing me. So, you know, I'm back. Of course, of course. So let's jump into cheat code number one for crafting your research proposal. And that is to pin down the what, the why, and the how before you start writing. So what do we mean by what, why, and how? And and why is it so important to get this down before we start writing, Dr. E? It seems relatively straightforward and seems relatively simple, but you'd be surprised how often people tend to overlook these things and throw themselves headfirst into the proposal without giving it too much thought ahead of time. The critical thing is to work out, as you said, the what part, which in this case is the topic of your proposal, the how part, which in this case is the methodological approach of of your proposal, and the why part, which is the rationale of your proposal, which is, in short, the relationship between your research aims and research questions perhaps even your research objectives. But ideally, those two, if not all three of these things will be worked out ahead of time. So you have a very, very clear sense of exactly what your topic is going to be and the parameters of that topic. That's the part that tends to matter. So very often people will identify a topic that they think is interesting or they think is compelling, but have no clear sense of what the limitations of that topic might happen to be, namely how much I'm actually going to be talking about and how far that research will extend. And then there's also the question as to the methodological approach or the how of the, re- of the research proposal and the appropriate way to go about trying to collect the data for the purposes of that research aim or trying to analyze the data that you do collect for the purposes of the re- research aim. Of course, all of these things can be subject to adjustment, tweaking and correction over time. But in order to give yourself the necessary grounding to kind of get off the ground, as it were, and get started, it's usually relatively helpful to just begin with a clear sense of that what, why, and how before you even get started. Yeah, so true, so true. It's there's an interesting dynamic here because one of the one of the things that we we tend to profess uh, on the Grad Coach blog and and certainly on the channel is that writing is itself a form of thinking, and so it's a great it's a great tool to use to flesh out your thinking, but. I think that is within, you know, a certain boundary when it comes to to writing a proposal. Sure, you know, if you want to just do some writing exercises to for your own mind to figure out your what, why and how and to really refine that, that's great. You can do that independently. But the idea is you don't want to start writing up your research proposal document, which is the structured formal document. You don't want to do that without having your your what, why and how really clearly articulated. So this is really just about making sure that you really understand what your topic is and how you're going to approach this thing. And, and as you said, why you've made those choices, why both for the topic, in other words, the justification for choosing your topic, what resource gap does that fill, and your methodological choices, why have you chosen to investigate it the way that you have. So let's jump on to cheat code number two, and that is to double check that your golden thread is perfectly aligned. What does this mean? This is this sounds like some grad coach long logo. Yeah, some golden threads. What are these about? And what's what does alignment look like? I mean, all right. So there's a couple of ways that we can look at this. Your golden thread could be interesting new slang terms for, you know, some really, really good drip. You know what I'm saying? But no, that's not what we mean in this particular case. Your golden thread is what you might expect if you've been on the grad coach page or you've heard these terms somewhere in, on our blogs or other places where we're really just talking about the link or the relationship, the thread that is that ties your research aim, your research questions and your research objectives in the first instance in any case. And that ideally the rationale, that is to say the thread, the links between these three points would extend across the entire proposal and ultimately the entire project itself. So that the logic of what it is that you're doing is something that holds up throughout the entire proposal. And this is something that often 
students or, or you know, first timers will tend to overlook because it's as almost as though once I've identified what my research aim is and I've identified what I think my research questions will be, and perhaps I've even identified what my research objectives will be, there's a tendency to just want to steam ahead now and say, okay, I've got these things and I can just get started. And although in the first instance, it might look like it's okay, what you'll find out as you start developing the project is the problems start to occur. So it's, it's very much like, I don't know if anybody's ever built a wall or done any kind of like manual labor like that, but what you'll notice is if you make a, even a tiny mistake in the very, very early instances, those gaps will start to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as that wall develops. So in the first instance, you might think I've got a research aim, research questions and research objectives that seem relatively related and I'm not gonna sweat too much about the tightness of that rationale or how closely connected they are. I'll just move on through the entire thing. But what you'll find is by the time you start getting to the data analysis, data collection, when you start trying to work out what all of these things mean, there are major gaps between the rationales and the positions of your, of your proposal, and then it's much, much harder to fix. So ideally what would be the case is that in the first instance, you try to derive your research aim from the gap that you identify in the literature, if possible. And then beyond that, if also possible, you will try to derive your research questions from that research aim. And then ideally you try to derive your research objectives from those research questions. And what that will tell you is that in every single case, there is a really clear, tight relationship or a golden thread between all three of these positions. Yeah, yeah, so, so true. I think this really links back to, to cheat code number one, which was about figuring out or clearly articulating the what, why, and how. And specifically, it links to the what, in other words, the research topic. You know, people speak about, use terminology like a research topic, uh, pretty loosely and think of it maybe as a research title. But really, when we're talking about the what, when we're talking about what is your research topic, what we're really talking about is what are your research aims, objectives and research questions? Those those three components really come together to form that research topic or, or articulate that research topic and making sure that those three things are really well aligned is, is super, super important. What we tend to see is that students have a certain set of research aims that are pointing in a certain direction and that might be a good direction might be a, not necessarily such a good direction if it doesn't fill a, a well articulated research gap um, but regardless they have these research aims and then they get down to the research objectives and the research questions and things start pulling in different directions. The, start, the research questions don't really tie too tightly into the research aims. The research objectives seem to be going in their own direction. And so what you end up with is these sort of three layers that are all kind of pulling in a different direction. And that is that is chaos. That's chaos for your proposal because your assessor is going to see that really, really quickly and go like, wait a minute, what what is the student actually trying to do in the study? And if for some reason that does make it past an assessor and your, your proposal does actually get accepted, you've created chaos for yourself when you actually need to go and undertake this research because now you've committed yourself to trying to tick all these different boxes. You've basically got a multitude of different directions that you have to go because you've kind of gone off course in terms of these three things. So keep that in mind, research aims, research questions, research objectives, and they should certainly all be aligned. And then to the earlier point that Dr. E made is all of this should be coming out of a research gap. There's, you know, you, you, you need to be addressing some sort of research gap. And so the tighter alignment you can get between all four of those things, even better. Absolutely. 1000%. I mean, I've often said that there's a security built into defining these terms at the earliest possible stage. So having a clear sense of what your, as you said, research gap, research aim, research objectives and research questions are, and the link between all of these things. It's not just that it gives you a helpful position to start from. It's not just that it gives you a clear idea of what it is that you're trying to achieve. But really, really, really importantly, it kind of ends up describing the parameters of your project, or I should say the perimeters of your project and quite specifically, which is to say that once you've got a sense of what my aim, my questions and my objectives are, that not only tells me what it is that we're going to be studying specifically, so what's within those boundaries and what exactly I'm going to be looking at, but it also describes the limitations of my research and what I won't be looking at. So it sets a really comfortable perimeter for you and says, okay, everything I'm going to be looking at is within this space that's it. I don't need to concern myself with what's beyond that in order to satisfy the requirements of my research. It just makes your life a lot easier. 
So, so, so true. We, we, we've spoken at length about the, the importance of focus, the importance about not fearing a narrow path. In fact, that's exactly where you should be going. You want to try to define as narrow a path as possible so that you can really go deep, that you can really uh, research something meaningful and something uh, substantive. So that is what a good, well-aligned, tightly aligned golden thread looks like. All right, so on to cheat code number three, and this is a very practical one. It's certainly not rocket science. Some might say that it's a little bit obvious and why are we talking about this, but it is nevertheless something that we see students not doing. And so it bears mention, and that is to draw up some sort of outline or to establish some sort of loose structure and draw up an accompanying outline before you start writing your proposal. Dr. E, why is this so important? Well, again, you're right. It sounds simple. It sounds almost self-evident, but you'd be surprised how often people miss the self-evident. So the skill here is really in the subtlety of the approach. And while it is the case that these are things that you assume you're going to do, there's a question about the depth and the detail that you're going to even in the outline or even in the proposal that you're setting up for yourself. So there's a couple of places that you can go to in the first instance to help you out. The likelihood of it is that your university will have something of a proposal outline or some requirements that they've got for what that proposal is supposed to look like. And you can, of course, ask them for that. If not that, they might have specific guidances for what they want to have included in the proposal and what, how that should be formatted. And of course, you can ask them for that too. And failing that, they might have some examples of past proposals that they have accepted from past students. And again, that can offer you at least some semblance of a guideline as to what's expected by your university, what you should and shouldn't be looking to include. And what I tell everybody all the time is that you can rest assured, this might be the first time you've done a research project. It certainly isn't the first time your university has done it. So the likelihood is that they have these things on file. They have this information on file. And even if they're hesitant in terms of giving them to you, you're perfectly within your rights to expect them or to ask for them. But if all else fails, you can go to our templates, you can go to our guidances on what proposals should look like in order to help you give some kind of outline and plan for what you should be putting in here. But ultimately, the key thing is that whatever you put in that proposal outline, so whatever you put in that structure, is really there for your own personal guidance. So whenever I've spoken to students in the past, what I've always told them is, look, whatever templates that you and I produce, whatever guidelines you and I produce for what we think your proposal is going to look like at this stage, it's certainly something that's going to be subject to adjustment, to tweaking, to correcting over the course of time. It's really just there in order to give you, as the person conducting the research, a clear sense of your path and a clear sense of your track from where you're going to where you, from where you are, forgive me, to where you're trying to be. And that's never the most straightforward thing in the world, particularly considering often we're talking about collecting data from live subjects and real world situations. Things change over the course of time. And insofar as that happens, you might find yourself in a position where you need to tweak something or you've read a piece of literature that's been published that you hadn't seen previously and maybe you want to adjust the research question. Or you've seen a problem with your data collection that you hadn't previously considered. Perhaps a site that you were going to collect the data from is not is no longer available and now you have to adjust the way you do this. The helpful thing is that if you already have an outline and you already have a guide, relatively straightforward to then just go back to that outline and adjust that one piece and then understand how that connects to everything else and make the necessary adjustments there and then carry on as you were doing. Without that there in the first place, any of these changes come up, any of these tweaks and adjustments come up and the likelihood is you're gonna miss something. So you might adjust that particular thing but completely neglect what that means for the remainder of your project or that's say for the remainder of your golden thread and the alignment between the research aims, questions and objectives and what that means for the rest of your research. So it's really, 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 really important, as simple as it sounds, to start yourself off with as much of an advantage as you possibly can, give yourself a clear game plan, give yourself a clear outline and say, okay, this is what it is I'm trying to achieve. This is how I'm trying to achieve it. This is how my proposal should look. These are the sections I need to include. And if I need to change that over time, I mean, hey, I'm the only one that saw it, right? I can't fail from there. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. And I think it's it's worth stating here yeah, or clarifying here yeah, that when we talk about an outline, we're really just talking about a bullet point list. You know, we're not we're not saying sort of pre-write your whole proposal or, you know, start crafting out your your paragraphs and whatnot. We're talking about 
a Word document, a Google Doc with really just a bullet point structure. And, and that structure is malleable, you know, as, as, as you said, you can move things around and you can shift things around. This, this outline is only for you. You're not submitting it. No one sees it. It's, it's really just a tool that you can use to, to structure your thinking, to structure your writing. And you can be developing this outline well before you get to the proposal writing stage. This is something that you can be developing while you're still busy looking at literature, while you're still busy figuring out your, your topic. You can have this outline, you can have this working document that you're busy putting things in, maybe some of the things you'll pull out, maybe some of the things you'll rearrange, but you'll be building a picture in your mind of what is this document going to look like. And what's beautiful about the outline uh, is that apart from just being a useful writing tool, in other words, if you have a well-populated outline, writing is a lot easier. Apart from that, it's also just it allows you to zoom out from the detail of perhaps, say, a 2,000, 3,000 word proposal where when, when everything is all written out, it's easy to kind of forget, well, what did I say back there? And does this align with that? Yeah. When you've just got a one page, a bullet point list of the things I'm going to talk about, you can zoom out, you can see quite easily, does this still fit with that? Does this still fit with that? Is there a narrative that flows through all of this? Is there something I'm missing? Is there uh, perhaps an assumption I've made? And so this is really just a, a very, very useful tool uh, or at least an approach that you can use not just with your proposal but pretty much for every chapter you'll you'll notice very quickly if you dig through any of the content on the blog or on this channel you'll notice that we're always prescribing outlining and it's not that we lack other good points to make it's just that this is such a useful one and such a practical one and something that's so often overlooked because students are time squeezed they don't want to write anything more than they need to so the idea of having to outline first and then start writing sounds like double work but really it isn't i, I can almost guarantee that if you're not outlining you're going to spend so much time revising that you'll end up spending a lot more time than you would have if you just put a little bit of time into revising so definitely a very important uh, technique to use throughout your research process 1000%. It's absolute facts. Listen, I'll say something my father used to always tell me when I was growing up, which is if you do something in a rush, be prepared to have to do it twice. Because the likelihood is if you didn't plan it ahead of time, you didn't think about it, you didn't really know what you were doing, you just plowed straight forward thinking that you can figure this out as you go along, everything's going to hit you. And then now you're going to find yourself in a position where you're doing, redoing, triple doing, quadruple doing that same thing that you thought you could figure out. And then before you know it, now you're talking to a great coach talking about, help me, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do. I mean, we could have made this a lot easier. You could have just come to me when you had it like clean and open. We could have outlined this. Listen, everybody says that in some instances, color by number isn't real art. Fine. I'm just saying set up the color by number for yourself. Write out the templates for yourself, draw out the outline for yourself, and then color by number, make your life easy. That's all we say. If there is there is a tendency uh, this, this we're sort of by uh, wandering off into a different problem but there is this tendency for students to feel like they just need to sit down and write and when they write it's going to be perfect first time round and it's just not like that you know the writing process is very much one of outlining the big picture first drawing a nasty first draft and then sort of refining and cycling through and iterating and 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 getting it into something that's really presentable so do yourself a favor otherwise you're just going to land up with a, a real muddled mess that you'll probably even have trouble understanding never mind your uh, assessor all right so let's talk about cheat code number four cheat code number four is that you need to stress both the significance and the viability of your proposed research. So Dr. E, what do these two things mean and, and why specifically are these two things so important when there's a whole lot of other detail that is perhaps a lot more evident and a lot more front and center in, in a proposal? Why are these two things so key? So in the first instance, your proposal really is trying to achieve one thing. It has one fundamental function for the purposes of the proposal, of course, your research project is other things, the details of data collection, data analysis, these are all other things. But in the research proposal, there is one ultimate function, which is you are proposing research that you intend to conduct 
on condition you are permitted to do so. Therefore, it seems relatively important that you want to make sure that the research that you are proposing to conduct is both something that's significant, that is to say, it proposes a meaningful contribution to the field, but it's also something that's practically viable. And this is, I mean, I can't overstate how important this is because again, Anybody can come up with a research proposal that sounds really wild, really interesting, could do really amazing things, particularly if you found a research gap that you could fill relatively quickly or in really, really compelling ways. That's cool. But the most important thing to work out is whether or not you can actually do that. And what I mean by that is in terms of viability, the ease by which you can collect the data you're looking for. So are the sites that you're proposing to go to for you to collect data something that you can actually access? Are the individuals that you're thinking about collecting data from, or the numbers of individuals that you're thinking about collecting data from, people that you can actually access? Is the way that you're proposing to collect that data something that will elicit a meaningful response from your participants? These are all rational questions of viability in terms of whether or not you can actually conduct the research that you're proposing to complete. And that part is critical as far as your university, your assessor, or your examiners are concerned, because it's kind of meaningless to go, be able to go ahead on a particular research proposal that we know that you can't complete or that we know that you couldn't get the data for or that we know that you couldn't access. So as kind of practical or as low level as it may seem, it is one of the fundamental functions of your research proposal, namely for you to be able to get the permission to actually conduct that research. So the viability can't be understated. That goes hand in hand with the significance of the research. And as I say, in this particular case, it's a little bit more than just saying, well, I wonder if there's a gap in this particular case or I wonder if anybody else has, has, has done it this particular way. I've often told people that, look, one thing is to be able to identify a research gap. The other thing is to be able to identify meaning in that gap. That is to say, well, perhaps there's a gap in a certain area because there should be other kinds of research and there's a gap in a particular field because it's just not interesting. Or maybe there's a gap in a particular field because it just doesn't mean very much. Or there's a gap in a particular field because there's just no real way to fill that gap with any meaningful data collection or otherwise. Again, that significance is something that you want to take into consideration. So it's not enough to say, well, I found a research gap and that gives me a contribution and I found a means of data collection and found a means of data analysis and that gives me a proposal. It has to be the case that the gap that you've identified actually means something. So it's a significant gap that offers a meaningful contribution to the field. But it's also the case that what you're proposing to collect, what data you're proposing to analyze and the way you propose to go about that is something that you can actually achieve. Those seem to me in any case, seem to grab coach in any case to be the critical things that you want to think about before you actually go ahead and start collecting the data and doing everything else that you're doing for the purposes of your research ultimately before you submit that proposal i think to our topic ideation course which is uh, one of our little boot camps where we help students uh, come up with a suitable topic or rather find a suitable topic and really if i were to distill that course down to to anything i would say it's about finding or we're providing mechanisms to help you find something that is both significant and that's viable. And these things go hand in hand. You, you can have a proposed project that is of tremendous significance. It might be world changing. You might cure cancer. You know, there's something insanely significant. But if it's not viable, it's not getting approved. And it's uh, students tend to, especially first time researchers, they tend to underestimate just how many constraints they are subject to in the real world. And these can be constraints in terms of what the university allows you to do. There might be ethical constraints in terms of your university's ethics policies. It might be just down to your expertise. It might be that, well, you know, you, you have grand ambitions, but you just don't really have the ability to pull off that sort of analysis. And you know, if if you're doing this for a master's dissertation or even doctoral work, that ability to do the analysis yourself is really, really important. So there are a lot of constraints and there are a lot of things that you need to consider in terms of viability. If I'm not mistaken, we cover 10 different independent factors that you need to assess and rank and score in the topic ideation bootcamp. So it's not like there's one or two things to consider. There's a lot of things to consider. And, and I'd go so far as to say that there's probably way more than 10, but that's what we cover in, in terms of our framework. So that viability component is 
is so, so important. I think it's really useful for students to think of the proposal as almost something of a sales pitch. And I know that this will make a lot of academics cringe, but ultimately the role of this proposal is to convince, it is to sell the university or the assessor or whoever is gonna approve this project, it's to sell them on your research idea. Now, obviously, you can't sell junk. You can't have a crummy research idea that's not adequately significant or viable and just you know get approval through superior sales skills. Well, it'll be very impressive if you do manage to do that. But nevertheless, even if your project is really significant and is very man or is very manageable or viable, you still need to communicate that really, really clearly. So what tends to happen or what can often happen with students is in their proposal, they're so busy sort of talking about the what, they're so busy talking about the, the, the nitty gritty details of what they're gonna do and all these bits and pieces, perhaps they're really focused on methodology, but they don't really communicate that significance and that viability adequately. And then what would be a great, uh, a great research project doesn't get approved because the university is just not sure whether or not the student has what it takes to do this project. And that's just because they haven't articulated it. It's not because they're incapable, it's just that they haven't articulated it. So that is why this this um, hyper clarity around significance and viability is so, so important. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, look, the proposal really is an opportunity. And it's it's helpful to think about in that in that fashion, which is to say that, of course, everybody wants to rush into the research project itself and start collecting data and analyzing all of this stuff and producing interesting results and, and what have you. And that's all fun and great for everybody involved. But the fact of the matter is having to have a proposal ahead of time actually saves you a lot of headache because it forces you into a position where you now have to ask yourself these questions. And all of the cheat codes that we proposed, you could theoretically reduce a lot of this down to sitting down and thinking about the whys and the so what of every aspect and every angle of what it is that you're trying to achieve. And you could exhaust those questions. That is to say, push yourself to the absolute limit of asking yourself the why and the so what behind everything that you're suggesting that you want to do. I can't tell you how often it's the case that I'll talk to a student or I'll talk to a client and they'll say the same thing. They've got a research proposal, they've got a research topic or a research aim. And the first thing I'll ask them is, well, that's interesting, but why are we doing that? And then you just get a blank stare or curiosity or confusion. Back. So I don't really know why I'm doing it. I haven't really thought about it beyond the point of it just seems interesting. I like, well, yeah, I agree with you. It seems interesting, but I guarantee you someone's going to ask you why. <laughs> you might want to have an answer to that question. And then once you've got the answer to that question, it doesn't hurt to keep pushing that. So once I know why I'm doing this beyond a certain point, ask why that matters again. And once I've got the answer to that, ask it again just to keep pushing yourself to the absolute limit and make sure that you've got every aspect of the proposal covered so that it's the case that when somebody does come along, whether it's your assessor, your examiner, or otherwise, and say, well, what do you think about this aspect of your proposal or why are we doing this particular thing or how does this make sense in terms of a contribution, you've got a relatively straightforward answer that you've already thought about. In fact, it helps it helps the sales pitch if you if you can respond to those questions with a kind of, well, obviously, attitude or like, duh, I've thought about this attitude. You want it to look like this is something that you've thought deeply about and they haven't. You're supposed to be the expert in this field because that's what we're proposing to become. I want to be the researcher that looks at this particular thing, which is to say that I want to position myself as an individual who has a degree of expertise in this particular field. It should therefore be the case that I've thought about this to a greater degree of depth than the person assessing me. So push yourself. Yeah, so, so, so true. If you don't have the confidence uh, to really uh, rally the troops for your research idea, then you can't expect your proposal to, to do the job for you. You've got to have thought these things through and you've got to have a very clear why for pretty much all of your decisions, as you say. All right, so we have covered quite a bit of ground here. So let's just quickly recap on these four cheat codes for writing your proposal. Number one is, as we said, you wanna pin down the what, the why, and the how before you start writing. In other words, flesh out your research idea, flesh out what you're planning to do before you start writing that proposal. Number two, you want to double check that your golden thread is perfectly, perfectly aligned. So this is your research aim, your research objectives, your research questions. You want to make sure that all those things are nice and tightly aligned, that they're all pulling in the same direction. 
Number three, you want to draw up some sort of loose outline or structure before you start writing. And number four is that whole thing of significance and viability. You want to be able to really communicate significance and viability as clearly as clearly as possible. So that pretty much wraps up our four cheat codes. I'm very tempted to just go on and on because there's a thousand little things buzzing around in my head that, that link to what we've discussed. But Dr. E, it was, as always, an absolute pleasure having you on board for what was hopefully another really insightful chat for our students. I mean, fingers crossed it was insightful. Fingers crossed it was helpful for, for any of those who are still out there and still wondering, still curious. It's not like we disappeared. I mean, there's a website. You can click us out, find me. We ain't going nowhere. Find more information. We're right here. All right, so that wraps up this episode of the podcast. Remember, if you are busy working on a research proposal, you can grab our free research proposal template over on the Grad Coach blog. You can find the link to that in the description. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please do remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons and be sure to check out this video next. I'll see you there.